Great. Uh, good morning, everyone, and welcome to Quick Bites. This is our 30 minute snap analysis of recent news events in the world of food and food policy. Um, as usual, we'll be recording today's webinar and it will be posted on our website and social channels later today. So if you enjoy it, please do share it. And as ever, we welcome your feedback. Please just email us with your comments and suggestions. We're really lucky to have Dan Parker with us today. Dan is all around br brilliant on all things marketing and advertising. He's currently applying his talents to vegetables, but that hasn't always been the case, has it, Dan? Tell us a bit about your background. Well, for my sins, I spent the best part of about 25 years uh, working in ad agencies. I owned an ad agency for about 15 years. Um, my major career clients were uh, uh, Coca-Cola and McDonald's, Walker's, quite a bit of the supermarkets. And then about nine years ago, I had a bit of an epiphany, realised I perhaps wasn't making the world a better place and uh, closed my ad agency and have since tried to uh, apply all, all, the, all the brilliance and cleverness that those companies have in terms of, 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 of manipulating food choice and trying to say, well, can we take some of those techniques and apply them to helping to make the good choices, easier choices for people. And so, as you see, I'm flanked by both a pepper and a broccoli who sit there on a daily basis, reminding me of the fact that these are the things I need to get people to eat. Brilliant. Well, we're very lucky to have you with us because we're going to take a little deeper dive into two little news events that happened on, on social media um, in the last couple of weeks. So the first um, was drawn to our attention by FT journalist Henry Mance, who tweeted um, a picture that Brendan Clark Smith MP had taken of himself at a, an event in Parliament, which was um, clearly a Cadbury's event, and he's holding a monster dairy milk. I mean, it's probably, I don't know, a metre and a half long from the picture. Um, and so it asks, it, you know, it prompts a lot of questions about, you know, lobbying, what are the rules, what was Cadbury's doing with that event, etc. So we're going to have a little bit of a discussion about that. And then the other event, which was on the 27th of April, um, was when Nestle launched its new Kit Kat breakfast cereal. And the marketing on the on the social media ads, um, which I think Josh will post in the in the chat in a moment, said mornings just got even better thanks to Kit Kat cereal. The Kit Kat brand we all know and love reimagined into a tasty and wait for it, nutritious breakfast cereal. The perfect balance of delicious milk, chocolate and water taste now in a crunchy cereal. Subsequently, in fact, that word nutritious has been removed from the marketing and been replaced with indulgence. Um, but obviously it tells us a story about the food system. I think what's important about both of these examples is that there's actually nothing particularly unique about them. This is normal in the supermarket aisles up and down the country, but they do tell us a lot about what's going wrong with our food system, how it's regulated, and that's what we're going to um, start with to, dis to discuss today. Um, so we're going to start with the breakfast cereals example, and I know Dan has a lot of experience about this. I went in search of the Kit Kat cereal because I managed to leave the box that the team had bought for this session in the office. And I didn't come back with Kit Kat. They didn't have it in Tesco, but they did have this this one, Kellogg's Crave, which down the side says natural grains, added goodness, no artificial colours or flavours. And when I poured out the 30 gram portion recommendation, I did put it in a bowl, but when I tipped it up in front of the camera, it kept falling out. So it's in a glass. And there you go. You can see how much that 30 gram portion is. So Crave, Kit Kat breakfast seal, these are all um, widely available in, in the supermarket aisles. Dan, you've been on the other side thinking about how to market some of these products. Tell us what goes on behind closed doors when companies are thinking about how to market these kinds of new products. OK, so a thing I've heard a thousand times in meetings is what's in it for mum. Right. So there is a you know there's a basic truth which is is, is unquestionably wrong is that 95 percent of family grocery shopping is done by mum, and what mum wants to do is she wants to give her kids the thing that her kids want. She wants her children to be happy, but she also wants to make sure that she's kind of doing the right thing in terms of giving them a nutritious meal. So every single expression of that product, whether it's an advert or a piece of packaging, or the back of it must be, is always saying. What's the bit of thing in here that says to mum, don't worry, this is okay. 
So your kid's pulling your arm saying, oh, I want that one, right? You're gonna look at, now sometimes this is quite subtle. So it might be a picture of an apple and you've got some product that's got, you know, that once upon a time had something that vaguely looked like an apple before it was processed to death in it. Right? And therefore there's a picture of an apple or there's a sprig of wheat gracefully spread across the front of the thing. You'll see lots of green, and then you'll see statements, which you've just read out a couple, which are put, which are unquestionably will be true, but they mislead. So they're high in fiber. They've got no added sugar. They're rich in vitamin this or mineral that. Right? Now, these things will always be true. But you're talking about if you look at the overall picture of the product, there's nothing mm. vaguely healthy about these products. So this bit of thing is the comfort factor. For mum, when she picks it up and goes, should I put it in my basket? Oh, look, don't worry, it's high in fibre. Boom, it's in the basket. And that's what you'll see. Now, this is particularly acute in packaging, right? which is what you're holding up today, because packaging packaging is like the wild west of advertising. So the Advertising Standards Authority, which regulates communications in terms of advertising, which is funded by and does lobby on behalf of the food industry, there is a specific exclusion in the advertising standards uh, rules and regulations for packaging. And this is because packaging is the most under uh, appreciated piece of the marketing mix. It's incredibly powerful packaging. It's very, very, you know, point of purchase, it's an advert of point of purchase. And it is specifically excluded because the food industry knows how powerful it is. And so the ASA rules that they might apply to a TV ad don't apply to a piece of packaging. And so therefore it's the Wild West and businesses are free to push things to about as far as they can possibly go. Yeah, it's interesting, this sort of comfort point and this word nutritious, which which Nestle used in the original marketing. I mean, they said it was marketing for a global audience. I don't really know why that would make much difference, whether it was it was global or the UK. But nonetheless, um, the term nutritious is kind of interesting as that kind of comfort thing. They had a little asterisk which linked to the fact that the cereal was fortified um, with with vitamins and minerals. So it's sort of strictly true i mean you know in terms of that narrow sense that you're talking about well, it's undefined like to, hey it's undefined well exactly it, that's what i think not, no not strictly true is the wrong way of saying it but that's how they justified presumably using the term is on the basis of the fact that they were they were fortifying it but then of course you know um there was a huge backlash on social media which resulted in them withdrawing withdrawing the term but i think i i also went back to the asa rules um around digital advertising because this was on a digital post and they have rules which says marketing communication should not condone or encourage attitudes associated with poor diets or unhealthy lifestyles and of course thinking that a cereal like that is nutritious is i would say whole, wholesale an attitude associated with poor diets right making those connections right so we have some controlled words and some uncontrolled words right so organic is a controlled word right but you'll see an awful lot of words like nutritious natural you mentioned earlier goodness these are completely undefined words and therefore there is no sort of regulation to hold people to that says well you can't say something's nutritious unless perhaps your nutrient profile model is suitable whatever it might be mm -hmm. so there is a freedom to use these words um which you know they are designed to mislead of course they are right there's nothing vaguely nutritious and i think we, we looked at that particular kit cat cereal and to, to your your point about the portion really an average portion size is 100 grams for most people certainly for older kids and for, for adults and 100 grams is 420 calories which is equivalent to two miles bars that's two miles bars for breakfast that's a great way to, to, to work rest and play and, and that's not including the milk and it's 24.7 grams of sugar which is more than the daily intake i think for certainly for kids it's and i think probably also for adults too so there is nothing vaguely healthy about this product but they can still say it's nutritious it's full of goodness it's they won't say natural for this product but you see it on an awful lot of snack bars right uh, and we have this one uh, says natural this one natural grains right. i mean this is cookies and cream 
Right, so we have this, uh, natural grains is a really, really popular one, and it will take a better, somebody better knowledge of nutrition than me, but my understanding is that you've so beaten the, the bejesus out of these natural grains by the time they get to someone's mouth, they don't actually offer a great deal of, of nutritional benefit, right? The point being, where we have a massive great loophole here is we have the ability for people to give the impression of being nutritious by using unregulated words with no regard to actually mm. the overall nutritional picture. Of, of that product and that for me is a regulatory loophole and the really we should be in a position which says well okay if you are scoring at a certain level on the overall picture of the nutrition then you should be restricted in any implication that this product is anything other than a, than a uh, what was the expression they ended up with indulgent I thought what a fantastic that goes from nutritious to indulgent in one day I mean those are two ends of the spectrum aren't they <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly I mean I think so you're referring also to the health and nutrition claims uh, rules. And of course, there are a whole bunch of terms which are highly regulated for their use um, around either claiming nutritional benefits or, or health benefits. And I went through all of those. And of course, the word nutritious isn't on the list as one that is regulated in that way that that, that you described. So, you know, do you think the answer then is just to substantially sort of beef up that 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 regulation, which may, of course, be be one route to go down? But I think I was left thinking, how is it possible to put something which is essentially like a pudding or an indulgent or a indulgent snack in the breakfast cereal aisle? Like, I mean, how does that work in terms of deciding what product goes in which category and where it where it appears in the supermarket you must have been in those conversations right. about where sure. stuff goes right but supermarkets just want to sell produce right to some great extent out outside of, of of perhaps they may have some sense of purpose about them as an organization and they have some regulations about them their job is to sell whatever it is that people want to buy right and the question they will ask is in my cereal aisle how do I maximize the somebody whose job it is to maximize the sales in that cereal aisle? There are people at, at companies like Kellogg's whose job it is to get their products to the maximum profile. And that commercial dynamic is driving the content of that section rather than any sort of need to feed people. Now, the other thing that's very interesting in this, and, and I, I had this moment my, myself when my child was a little bit younger, and the Moana movie was out. And I went to the cereal section and I was looking on the top shelf, the kind of, you know, or organic cardboard flakes that I hope to, to get my child to eat. And there at his level, in a row, were four boxes of breakfast cereal that had Maui and Moana on the front of the packaging. And it was at his eye level when he was probably about six or something like that. Right? And he went to me, I want that one. Right? And of course, it was awful. You know, the sugar was incredibly high. It was terrible product right and that is by design right there is a by design moment that you'll, you'll normally find at three quarter height are the signature cereal brands like Kellogg's Corn Flakes because it helps us navigate the store because we look for signature brands at three quarter height we spot the Corn Flakes we know that's where the cereal is so we go there and then the child height and if you think if you if you, if you ever think of a store at the height of, of a child you'll realize there's a whole bunch of marketing going on at sort of three feet off the ground that us that adults don't realize, but is there to get your child to pester you to buy their products. And cereals is the absolute biscuits is another really good example, right? The biscuits that kids will like will be at three feet off the ground, right? Mm -hmm. Not the ones that you would like your kids to have. And you know, and that is, you know, this total control of the environment. Yeah. The other word I wanted to pick up on, which I think is the subtlest and in some ways the cleverest word of the lot, is if I ask a nutritionist or a dietitian, it to very briefly explain to me what a good diet looked like is I absolutely guaranteed they will use the word balanced. Right? You should eat a balanced diet. We all have that in our head. And you'll find on almost every bit of this bit of content, the word balanced. So you're you went out earlier, everybody focuses on nutritious, but the other clever word in here is the perfect balance. And I suspect mm. if I, I challenge anybody, to anybody who's, who's, who's watching in on this. Yeah, you're right. It says pick it on up here. the unhealthy products and you will find the word balanced because it is. It is subliminal enjoy, in as part, enjoy as part of a varied and balanced diet and a healthy lifestyle bingo right. and you'll also see things this is something um from from uh Capri's, uh when i pick up the, the snacking sites you're just going to see 
all these words, so this is yeah, further information on the kit one cat thing, right? It'll all talk about a balanced diet, but also it'll talk about the perfect balance of grain and chocolate. The word balance just gets used again and again and again because subliminally to us, balance means healthy. Mm. But of course, in the dictionary, okay. balance means something completely different, right? Yeah. And again, I want to just briefly balance, tell you, should balance be a protected word? Very hard to protect a word like balance, isn't it? Yeah. Well, that's it. I mean, that that's the challenge about regulating some of this stuff is um is you're into such a sort of micro level of granularity in the regulations. Um, but and then so to some extent, you at the moment we're very reliant on companies showing a level of responsibility. And um I think it's interesting that this happened from Nestle this week because just a couple of months ago, Nestle took the quite significant step of agreeing to report on the healthiness of their sales globally and reporting that across 13 markets um, using recognised nutrient profile scores. So they took quite a bold step publicly on the sort of policy side to sort of signal um, that they wanted to move in the right direction. But yet... They then launch a product like this, which is clearly the antithesis of a company which says, you know, their strap line is, we believe in the power of food to enhance lives. I mean, so uh, it's it's interesting that these two things happen at the same time within the space of a couple of months from a big, big global corporation. Right. You also have to look for the, um, the little uh, clever tricks in all of that. So one is if you take the classic McDonald's approach, McDonald's will talk to you about the po the profile of their menu rather than the profile of their sales. So we'll sit there and go, look, there's, there's carrot sticks yeah. and salads. You know, nobody ever went to McDonald's for a salad, right? Likewise, what we'll also see, and this is particularly true of companies like Coca-Cola, is they will go and buy things like water companies. Part of the fact that water companies are very profitable places to be, it means that actually what they'll say is that the percentage of Coca-Cola beverages that are sold that contain more than this much sugar have dropped from 20% to 10%, but not because they're selling their sugary drinks, but because they've gone and bought a water company. Mm. Or a coffee company all of these and it's all about the manipulation of how this information is presented what are we hoping for from a company like nestle we're hoping the company like nestle puts less sugar in our children than it does today and i suspect that's not what they're looking to report well we'll wait and see what how the reporting unfolds um obviously i mean we thought that that was a really important step in the right direction in terms of level of transparency and one that we're urging other companies to follow suit on but of course, the step, in reality, that you're right. It, the the proof is in actually the products and what's being sold. Right, but the the, the real moment of truth says that if we if if people who make the argument of personal responsibility and there's always going to be an element of personal responsibility is that personal responsibility without empowering people with a transparency and accessible information is not personal responsibility. So the whole things like the traffic light labeling system is designed as a masterpiece to confusion. And what we need is a very simple, mandatory, front of pack and advertising label that is like we get with, if we, you know, if you buy a fridge, you can buy an A fridge, a B fridge, a C fridge. We don't really understand what it means, but we kind of basically, it guides us to making a choice based mm. on its environmental impact. Such systems exist for food, and the bravest thing a company like Nestle can do is to actually say, we're going to do mandatory front of pack, simple labeling for everybody to make informed choices on every single product we produce. That would be a commitment. Yeah, yeah. OK, let's move on to the Cadbury's example. This is a slightly different situation. And I'm going to read the rather amusing tweet, which um, Christian Calgi, who um, is a senior political correspondent for The Express, sent around um, having seen uh, Brendan Clark Smith's photo of his giant Cadbury's bar. He said, um, the bars around Parliament because of the free Cadbury chocolate event is, a, is like that akin to a vote of no confidence. <laughs> Absolute fever pitch, hunger games tension as the entire estate sprints to the terrace to nab their free bars. When I say free bars, parliamentary staffers are literally walking out, of the ba the, uh, walking out with bags of like 10 family sized bars of chocolate, cream eggs, bags of Maynard wine gums. This is a diabetic powder keg waiting to explode. <laughs> love, love some of the social media stuff that goes on. 
Anyway, we, what was interesting is we did an event just the week before in Parliament where we actually gave out free vegetables to the people who came along. Um, it was a popular event and all the veg were taken. They were absolutely delicious, produced um, by Better Food Traders in, the, um, in, in London. Um, so we did something similar. Um, and so it prompted me to think, you know, what's the difference here? What are the rules? Um, you, I think, uh, what I think Cadbury's were doing were launching this um, mindful snacking uh, sort of idea or concept and their reduced sugar um, chocolate bar. I think you've had a look, haven't you, Dan, at the um, the mindful snacking website. What did you, what was your assessment? Well, I mean, first of all, I have to say that I almost admire the audacity of running a promotion about encouraging people more wine for their snacking whilst handing out chocolate bars the size of surfboards. I mean, it, 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 it's so blatant. It's it's just, you know, you've, you've got to admire their goal, if not anything else. Right? Um, What's mindful snacking? Now, for me, mindful snacking is making sure you eat a proper breakfast so you don't have, so you're not hungry by 11 o'clock. Um, and so if you have a bowl of Kit Kat cereal, the chances are that that's going to charge your metabolism at such a pace by 11 o'clock you're hungry and you're going to position yourself nicely for a snack. Right? The... Snacking is, is a cultural phenomenon. I mean, if you go back to the 1960s, we get three square meals a day. Well, actually, most people in the UK eat something like six meals a day. And actually, most people are almost continuously grazing uh, throughout the day, which is primarily around the world of snacks of crisps and biscuits and chocolate and what have you, which is why those industries have grown so fast. So snacking is, is the absolute basis by which that entire industry's commercial foundations exist. If you look at the kind of snack mindful Dot com, which uh, I see popped up on the chat. It, it, it's a very, very clever piece of, of, of subliminal psychology. I, I was ch I challenging people when they look at it to scroll down to why do I want to snack? And this is sort of presented as, well, you should sort of think about it before you snack. But actually what it's really doing is reminding us of all the reasons why we tell ourselves why we want to snack. So if I say to you, well, you know, you have another snack, why is that? You're going to say something like, well, you know, Oh, I'm feeling really low of energy. I need a bit of a boost or I'm hungry or I just need a bit of a break. You know, where'd they get that from? Or it's a social situation, therefore I should be sharing. I mean, if you look at like the Maltesers ads, for example, they're all about um, female friendship and empowerment, togetherness and sharing a bag of Maltesers whilst laughing about things that, that are relevant to, to girl bonding, right? It's all about having a treat. Now, what this is cleverly done, the way this is presented is, is actually what it's doing is reinforcing what advertising has been telling us for years, which is have a snack because you deserve it. Have a snack because you need a break. Have a snack because you're short of energy. A Mars day helps you work, rest and play, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And all they've done is really spin that round and encourage people to think about all the reasons why you're going to have a snack. Yes. OK, so um, Cadbury's has done um, a clever thing there with its mindful snacking, and it was obviously drawing attention to that whole uh, initiative with MPs, presumably to build some comfort um, amongst MPs around um, responsibility within the confectionery confectionery industry, right? I don't you know? We're we're very very responsible. Please don't regulate us. Yeah, yeah, That's exactly. And I thought I'd take a little look actually at what the the rules are on lobbying. There's, I would definitely recommend. Um, to people listening, the the research which Anthony So has published under the banner of the Food Research Collaboration at City University, because what he's done is he's gone through um, obviously ministerial meetings um, are record disclosed and recorded on a register, so it's possible to analyse that data. And he's done some analysis for different time periods across different departments, showing. Um, company food companies and the frequency of their meetings with uh with ministers um but he does point out so that's a good thing that that is disclosed um he does point out some kind of key loopholes um in the current rules um he says at the moment you can it's not really required to actually explain what the intended outcome of the meeting is um or the per you know the real purpose of it it might just say sort of like update on policy or something incredibly vague 
Um, you also don't need to disclose meetings with senior civil servants or SPADs or other, or some. sometimes the SPADs are included and sometimes they're not. It's a bit of inconsistency across different departments, but phone calls, dinners, that kind of thing don't need to be reported. Um, and uh, so, that, so the, the lobbying rules are a little flimsy potentially for really understanding the extent but 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 even with in the in the context of them being a little flimsy um Anthony does show the sort of huge number of visits that were made to uh the Department for Culture Media and Sport in the run-up to discussing the advertising regulations around um junk food for example um and an interesting that that was very much concentrated on DCMS and not the Department of Health. Um, and he makes some suggestions as to as to why that, that must, must have been. But I think at the end of the day, the the event in in Parliament is uh, completely you know fine to have within the context of the current of the current rules. Um, and that sort of um, yeah, I suppose building a narrative with policymakers about business responsibility is absolutely business as usual um, uh, on this kind of agenda. And of course, it also means that organisations like the Food Foundation can have events about vegetables, um, even though we're obviously not eating nearly enough vegetables and probably a bit too much Cadbury's snacks. Um, <laughs> I suppose if you had that turn, it's at least Theresa Coffee will turn up. Yes. <laughs> yeah. But I think, I mean, to me, and I think the, on, the you know, the sort of huge uh, number of new uh, research findings, Chris Van Tulliken's book last week about ultra processed food, I think it's triggering a bigger conversation about are the rules right to actually um, control and create some new incentives for the food industry around moving into healthier products and dampening down some of these claims around products which are clearly not um, what we should be eating in large quantities or are not part of really our diet transition to healthier healthier outcomes. What do you think? I mean, do you think that the, what, what, how would you summarise your view of what needs to happen on the policy front? Well, we face a tricky challenge, don't we, is um, we live in a neoliberal food culture. Right, which is not just true in Westminster, it's true generally in most homes in this country, which is with, essentially we believe in a fabric of personal responsibility. And for, for many people who are campaigning to try and make a healthier food environment, we swim against that kind of current, on the, that's our make it biggest challenge, right? The whole point here about personal responsibility is if you give people misleading information, then surely that takes away the ability for personal responsibility. If you're trying to persuade children do we consider six, seven, eight, nine-year-olds to have sufficient skills and personal responsibility to, to make adult decisions? No, we don't. That's why they don't get to vote or drive a car, right? And so you can almost turn that context, because I think we're going to find it really hard to change that fundamental neoliberal culture that exists. Mm. It's the reality of the world that we live in, and it's, it's poisonous, sure, to me, but it is the world we live in. So we still need to think about saying, well, okay, let's focus on trans, let's, let's focus on protecting children because that's what we do as a society and I'm doing very well in this space and secondly let's focus on making sure that products and advertising and things are there are honest and transparent and simple for people to understand and then also let's make sure um, you know I went to a conversation the other day about food education what's the purpose of food education in schools it's to equip people to navigate what is a very negative and unhealthy food and environment in a way that allows them to live healthy and sustainable lives. And we should be sitting that into the heart of our education system and say, let's make sure that we, we set our kids up to be able to navigate. Because yes, we are going to improve our food environment and we're going to work really, really hard for that. But realistically, we're going to continue to have a negative food environment mm -hmm. as long as we can live, live in a free capitalist society, right? So we have to equip everybody to navigate that as best they can. Uh, and, and that's where I feel there are so many holes in our education system and so many holes in our regulatory framework in sort to make sure that it's uh, it, it's a fair, open, honest playing field. Let's get there as a first place to get to. Mm -hmm. uh, and that yeah. seems a perfectly reasonable thing to say to anybody, however neoliberal they are. Thanks, Dan. I mean, I think you put your your finger on it when you use the word honest. I mean, if we're if if anyone believes in and, you know, personal responsibility is the root out of this. 
it's purely a prerequisite is that they are given honest information about what they're about what they're eating so it's an, an absolute sort of first base principle and one that we've seen here the intolerable, pressure, the intolerable pressure from food deserts and excessive access to low cost really low quality junk food processed food takeaway food you know the the, the environment is so hostile for people to have a fair chance at personal responsibility that we have to we have to take that pressure down mm. and create a better and more positive environment for people where they can you know making the healthy choice the easy choice is a line that it, it, we all use and is very true thank you dan fantastic to chat to you today we're timed out um uh, it was really brilliant to have your insights. Thank you for joining us. And thank you all for joining us too. And have a very happy long weekend. Enjoying your coronation quiche. See you soon. <laughs> With vegetables. With vegetables. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Cheers. All right. Bye. See you soon. Bye.